We make mistakes. Speak for yourself. What? <laughs> <laughs> Got a confident guy over These here. are the top five mistakes that Brooke made when opening a makerspace. Whose idea was it to open the makerspace in the first place, though? I solved the mistakes. No! <laughs> <laughs> He's full of it. I've made some mistakes. When you're opening any business, you make mistakes. Hello? Hi, I'm Michael. And I'm Brooke. And this is Maker's Workshop. Number one, not buying the right machine. So when we were first opening up, the digital tools was the main focus that we were putting on the space. And we didn't necessarily know a lot about the different digital tools and what they did and what the difference was mainly between a hobby level machine like an X-Carve to a more professional or industrial quality carving machine. Oh. I'll use the example of the laser cutter where we started with a Glowforge and at the time, I didn't necessarily, I was new to the world of digital fabrication at that point, so I didn't necessarily understand what the difference was between a Glowforge and one of the more industrial lasers. Yeah. And didn't fully think through the part where six months in, we might outgrow the one that we started well, with. Well, it ends up being more cost effective in the long haul to just to just save up a little bit more and get the big machine. And also we'll put the list of machines, uh, specifically digital tools that we started with on the screen right now. Like that is what we started the makerspace with, was those machines. Um, and the solution to this I think it's a tricky one because obviously budget's a concern if you're starting a makerspace, like there's not endless money per se, um, but it's a worthy line item to spend the money on getting the nice tools. From a marketing standpoint, if people are gonna be spending money on a membership to belong to the dream workshop, right? You gotta make sure you have a really, really cool workshop. So I would say a good way to think about it is like if digital tools are your thing, pick at least one machine I would say, and at least get like one really big bed size, one really large machine. And then that can kind of be the anchor maybe. And then you can kind of, um, not skimp, but you can maybe spend a little bit less on the others. One of the things we've come to learn now too is, is that price doesn't necessarily, is not the only factor in if the machine is good or professional. Yeah. Um, you know, like for example, with the CNC routers, um, the X-Carve, Pro, I believe, is in the five to six thousand dollar range. Well, for only one or two thousand more, which is not necessarily a huge shift to that budget, you can get a similar sized industrial unit from like Penguin CNC. Or with the laser, the Glowforge Pros cost about six thousand dollars. Expensive. It's yeah, expensive. Yeah, an expensive machine. You know, for 1,000 more, you can double your bed size and get the mid-range Laguna. Yeah, yeah. Um, with twice as much power and twice the bed size. So you want to just be sure that you do a lot of research and pick the right mix of machines from the beginning. Like a Glowforge, I do think, is a great machine, but I think it's something that people can maybe picture having in their house. Right. Versus our big Laguna EX laser, like not everybody even wants that. Even if you think it's cool, like who the heck wants that in their house necessarily? It takes up a lot. Of <laughs> it takes a lot. It's really heavy. It's big, and so on. So from a member value perspective, that's going to have more value. Yeah long term than a small one that will fit on a desk. And to be fair to us, at the time when we were buying all the machines, there wasn't anywhere that we could go to get our hands on a lot of them. We needed to go based off of what the internet was putting out as their marketing material and whatnot and just not guess. Like, I wouldn't say we guessed. You, you did a lot of research, but... But a lot of the content at the time was put out by the companies that do make the more hobby type machine. They're selling to individuals. We're selling a makerspace that's then selling to individuals. Like we're not the same market. Number two, not budgeting for a wood shop. Like this one's a little embarrassing, but we didn't think about a wood shop. Cause we were really into the digital tools when we, when we wanted the makerspace and we don't have a ton of space either. Our space is very long and narrow and we got everything all situated, the space all planned out, the digital tools all looking great in the space. And then there's one day where we are like, we need a wood shop, don't we? Like, what do we do with the pieces after they come off of the CNC router? Yeah. And so like in our case, <laughs> by missing that fairly obvious thing, 
Yeah. Um, we hadn't budgeted it in. We hadn't money built wise. A, no. We hadn't built a room for it yes. when we built out the space. No. And so it kind of became this last minute. Okay, how do we make this work? Well, like dust collection, noise. Yeah, that was that was not a good that was not good. Solution wise, to keep it affordable, we did go and we just got like all the like Amazon quality when band saws, drill presses. Um, we didn't immediately have a table saw like that just didn't exist in our space for the first bit. Yeah, it took about a year before we were able to afford the saw stop, and we felt strongly that we wanted the saw stop because of the safety components yeah. that come with it for the public space. The short-term solution was to go with cheaper tools, and then the longer-term solution was get the better tool one at a time as yeah. the cheaper tools have broken or as the need has arisen. And in fairness to us, <laughs> we went from the planning stage to liquidating our old shop to turning it into a makerspace in a very short time period. It was yeah. like six months from conception to making it happen. So in fairness, maybe a little more time planning or would thinking about it would have been a good idea. We did it a little impulsive. A solution that somebody else could take from this is like just just yeah like you want the big cool tools but like you also do need it do need a jigsaw and stuff and that's something to think about. Number three doing day passes. Don't do them. Don't do it. When we were first starting out we obviously didn't have any members yet and so we were like well how can we pull people in and oh maybe if we do like an increased rate for people to just come use the stuff on a daily basis and not need to like join then that might be great and what we very quickly learned was that there is a training aspect that goes into it safety safety it's not safe and it ends up it ended up just kind of taking for one person it would take us away from the broader community that we are and the broader goals that we were trying to put into play if someone's coming in for a day pass and they're paying us to spend a day in the makerspace like we're not gonna not sit with them and make sure they're having a good experience but the, then the problem is like they're paying paying a certain rate and then like it's our whole day where we are needing to make sure they're being safe they don't necessarily know how to use any of the tools and whatever and it just wasn't worth it for us and they would specifically most of the time be coming in for th tools that did require more of a learning curve it just became abundantly clear to us like this just is a product that it's not it's just not the right fit and, and again it takes us away from our members like if someone's paying us to be a member at the makerspace those are the people that we want to invest a bit more of our time and energy in because they're more invested in us so seems fair and our remedy to that one was to just stop offering it. stopped offering it and actually no one's even really mentioned it so worked out fine for us number four being too accommodating to the general public and this kind of links into the day passes but our shop is on a downtown so there's foot traffic regularly in front of our window and our door and people come in all the time they're curious they'll, they'll want to like see what we're doing and I think at first we were trying to get members and we're thinking oh great like marketing opportunity let's show people the space we can walk through and you know 15 minutes at a time isn't that big of a deal but we came to realize really quickly that like when people are coming in off the street and we're too accommodating and too nice like it's a workshop space that we're bringing people through it very quickly again kind of pulls our energy away from the people that are coming and you know hanging out for the day that are members um, and if they had hyper kids with them then yeah. that potentially becomes a safety concern i feel more guilty about it than you do but like it's important to not feel guilty about having a boundary there so we typically ask people to schedule a tour now um that type of thing because it just it pulls us away in a way that isn't fair to the people that are paying, you know, to be there. The other thing is that our town does really amazing public town events, which are actually really fun and we really like them. We used to do like free ornaments and we used to do like free food and really jump into those thinking, okay, marketing opportunity to really engage with these public events. But we realized really quickly that rarely did those ever translate to members coming in. Almost always if people wanted to be a member at our makerspace, like they find us online and walk in and are like, I wanna be a member. We didn't need to do all that. So once again, simple solution, just don't do it. Don't feel guilty about it. And that leads us right into mistake number five, which is that you can't be everything to everyone. And the earlier that you realize that, um, the better. Originally, as these people would come in, they'd be like, oh, hey, can I have a cutting board? I, you know, they want to commission work and we'd try to like bend over backwards to accommodate them, even thinking, if it wasn't part of our primary right, business focus. It's, it's easy when you're first starting a business to think, okay, I, I need to, you know, make a dollar. I need not make a dollar. It's really easy when you're starting a business to be thinking like, I need to 
make money, right? This customer wants something from me, so let me do that. That's not to say that if you're having a really tight month and someone comes in and they want a pretty simple table that you know the CNC machine can kick out pretty quick, like you can say yes, yeah. but just don't make that the general policy of, yeah. of taking on all this stuff that doesn't actually fit within the business. Right, so another like anecdotal uh, example I can give specific to our space is we would get people often that would come in off the street, we'd show them the space, they'd say, oh, this is really cool, I really like what you're doing, I don't really want a membership, it's not really for me, you know, is there anything I could just like buy from you to support you? And so we thought, oh, well, why don't we put a little shop in of things we've made, front hallway, so that if people come in, they can purchase things. Um, and support us that way if membership's not for them. And the joke is, like, it never we really... Sold, we, we sold a couple things out of yeah. it, but it ended up taking more effort to keep it up, and it took away from the ability to have, like, materials for the members to buy in that space. Yeah, you know, now we have slabs there that we sell, <laughs> and not, um... And that's a much straighter line to the other part of the business, which is making things. So now the members can just grab a slab off the wall kind of and cool. make yeah. something cool. Yeah, yeah. And I think that this also, it, it's business advice, I think, for any business that you're in. It's just, just be really clear. Like, what, what is the product you're selling? Who is, who is your ultimate end consumer? Stick to that, and that's the, you know, that's the way to go. So there you have it. Five mistakes. That we made when we opened Maker's Workshop. Yeah. But here's the good thing. Even though we made mistakes, it worked out well. And stuff's getting better. Stuff's getting better every day. <laughs> That was a quote from my favorite movie. What movie is it? <laughs> the Postman. Oh. Stop skin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Until next time, I'm Michael. I'm Brooke. And this is Maker's Workshop. Bye. Bye. Bye.